Throughout this series, we've already seen quite a few different faces on our cursed hero, Turin. We've seen the young son of Hurin, who fled from his home as a child before being adopted by an elven king. We've seen Nathan the Wronged, an outlaw living in the wild with the semi-villainous Wolfmen. We've seen Gorthol, a captain of Morgoth's enemies leading a war of resistance against the Dark Lord's dominion. And we've seen a prisoner driven to madness by the death of his beloved Beleg Cuthalion. But all of that is now behind us. In this video, we are going to begin a new chapter in Turin's life. We're going to see him reinvent himself. We're going to see what it takes to try and rid himself of all that's come before, to escape the doom of his curse. This is Turin Reforged. Maya Govan and Melanine, and welcome to another installment in this series explaining and breaking down Tolkien's epic first age tale of the children of Hurin. In the last video, I talked about the death of Turin's best buddy, Beleg Cuthalion, and his first meeting with his new elvish buddy, Prince Gwyndor of Nargothrond. And now that Beleg's gone, it is up to Gwyndor to lead Turin all the way to the hidden elvish kingdom from whence he came. And there, in Nargothrond, Turin will, for a time, make a new home for himself. But before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about this kingdom of Nargothrond. Many, many centuries ago, before the Noldor even returned to Middle-earth and the War of the Jewels began, there was a dwarven settlement beneath the hills that rise above the river Narog. Caverns that had been secretly delved in ancient days by the mysterious and now almost extinct petty dwarves of Beleriand. And in the language of these lesser dwarves, their caverns were called Nolukizdin. However, over the years, the dwarven population of Nolukizdin waned until eventually it was abandoned by those who delved it, and all that remained of Nolukizdin were a series of empty caves. But then came along the phenomenally friendly Finrod Felagund, a prince of the Noldor who once dreamed an all-important dream courtesy of Ulmo a lord of the Valar, a little bit like the God of Waters. Interestingly, there is also a different Valar called Irmo, who is the actual lord of sleep and dreams and visions, and I've long held the speculation that Irmo was also somehow involved in giving Finrod the dream that he needed. But either way, by the banks of the Great River, a divinely deep sleep was laid upon Finrod Felagund, and in the heavy dreams that followed, he received a message from Ulmo himself. When Finrod awoke, it seemed to him that he was bidden to prepare for a day of evil, and to establish a retreat, lest Morgoth should burst from Angband and overthrow the armies of the north. Now, if you're familiar with the story, then you will of course know that Finrod's wonderful cousin, Turgon, the second son of Fingolfin, also received a very similar dream from Ulmo at the exact same time, and Turgon's dream inspired the founding of the super-secret city of Gondolin. But Finrod's dream? That is the reason that we even have a kingdom called Nargothrond. Which I think is important. Nargothrond isn't just some place that happens to exist because, you know, various things happen throughout history. It is a secret kingdom founded for the specific purpose of enduring in a world that Morgoth is slowly taking dominion of. And Lord Ulamo himself, who is among the mightiest of all the Valar, has a vested interest in its well-being. Nargothrond is meant to be. 
However, that does not, of course, mean that we're going to get a happy story here. 413 years after Fenrod founded Nargothrond, he was killed. And with Fenrod gone, the kingdom of Nargothrond passed to his younger brother, the new king, Ordreth. One could potentially argue that Ordreth is basically very similar to Fenrod Felagund, except absent most of the reasons why we really like Fenrod Felagund. He's kind of a discount Fenrod. You know, there's nothing inherently wrong with Ordreth, and he does have his moments. He did indeed permanently banish the worst two sons of Feanor from Nargothrond, which is pretty epic. But, I mean Fingolfin, for example. He is great with a capital G. Like, in the most straightforward Alexander the kind of way. And Ordreth is, at best, hmm, kind of okay. Anyway, while we're on the topic of King Ordreth the kind of okay's family, there is a brand new character that I need to introduce, and that is the princess of Nargothrond Ordreth's daughter, a lady called Finduilas. We are never given a date of birth for Finduilas, so it is impossible to say exactly how old she is, but given what we are told, it seems almost certain she would have been born in Middle-earth, after the return of the Noldor. Which means, relative to other elves in this story, Finduilas is really quite young being, at the absolute most, under 500 years old. And if you Google Finduilas, daughter of Ordreth, there is a high chance you will find something online about her brother, the incredibly iconic Second Age legend, our future High King of the Noldor, Gil-galad. Now, on the one hand, that is absolutely correct. Tolkien did indeed write that Gil-galad was the son of Ordreth, and thus he is the brother of Finduilas. In fact, Christopher Tolkien even wrote that this was his father's final intent, in air quotes, whatever that means. Gil-galad was apparently supposed to be the son of Ordreth. But the straightforward truth is that this simply does not make sense within the context of everything else that Tolkien wrote. I have a whole video where I go into much deeper detail on this, so check it out if you're interested. But regardless of the fact that Tolkien changed his mind, regardless of the potential fact that he might have changed it again if he lived longer, he did not change his writings to reflect it. In the published Silmarillion, Gil-galad is the son of High King Fingon. He is the grandson of High King Fingolfin. And although I know I just said that the question of Ordreth's parentage is not that important in the grand scheme of his character, I firmly believe that the same is not true of Gil-galad. If Gil-galad is the brother of Finduilas, then a massive part of this otherwise very internally consistent story just isn't going to make sense. He is a distant cousin of Finduilas, and, you know, obviously this is fiction, every reader has a right to imagine it in their own way, but in my opinion, the story is much stronger if Gil-galad is not Finduilas' brother, and if he's not present in this part of it. However, there is another elvish guy in Finduilas' orbit who has a name beginning with G, and that is Turin's newfound and most excellent friend, Prince Gwyndor. In fact, it would appear that Finduilas might potentially be the reason why Gwyndor has that title of prince. Back in the day, Gwyndor and Princess Finduilas were very much in love. As it goes, they were betrothed, engaged to be married, and such was Gwyndor's love for Princess Finduilas that he named her Firelivreen, which literally means the sheen of the sun upon those beautiful, almost sacred pools created and protected by, of all people, Ulmo, 
Aethel Ivrine, the place that Gwyndor led Turin to at the end of the last video, where Turin's madness was healed. But those happy days in Nargothrond, the years in which Gwyndor and Finduilas fell in love, now seem a very long time ago. As you definitely already know, in the disastrous fifth battle for Beleriand, the Nirnaeth Arnoidiad, Gwyndor rode to war against the will of King Ordreth in the hope of either rescuing, or if not, avenging his brother Gelmir, who had been enslaved by Morgoth within the pits of Angband. However, in that unfortunate battle, Gwyndor was himself captured and enslaved, and he has now spent 17 years suffering unimaginable torment as a thrall of Morgoths. And the incredibly tragic truth is that when Gwyndor finally does return home to Nargothrond, at first his own people did not know him. For the last time they saw him, he looked young and strong, but now he seems as one of the aged among mortal men. In fact, upon Gwyndor's long-delayed homecoming, there is only one elf in Nargothrond who does recognize him. And that is the woman he loves, his princess Finduilas. And so, Gwyndor's triumphant return is actually really quite a bittersweet one. But it is for his sake that the mortal man Turin is also admitted into Nargothrond, which is a big deal. One or two mortal men have been to Nargothrond before. Beren obviously spent a very brief bit of time there, and his ancestor Beor, for whom the House of Beor takes its name, also lived out the end of his life as a guest there. But as a rule, outsiders are not welcome in Nargothrond, especially in these dark days of Morgoth's dominion. Nargothrond is the very definition of a secret isolationist kingdom. And yet, once again, the rules are bent for Turin. Gwyndor describes his new friend to the elves of Nargothrond as a valiant man, dear friend of Beleg Cutharion in Doriath. But before Gwyndor can tell everyone Turin's name, Turin interrupts him. And instead, Turin introduces himself as Agarwain, son of Umarth, which means blood-stained, son of ill fate. Once again, Turin is reinventing himself. Once again, he is bestowing upon himself a new identity. Now that he is aware of the curse that Morgoth has laid upon himself and his family, he seems to show a real desire to try and escape not only that curse, but also his identity. And the way he goes about doing it is by effectively reforging himself. No longer is he Turin, son of Hurin, the cursed man of Dor Lomin. No longer is he Gorthol, the dread helm of Dor Cuarthol. And no longer is he Neathan the Wronged, captain of the Gaurwaith. Now, he is Agarwain. Although, as you will see in a few minutes, that is not the only new name that Turin is going to take whilst living in Nargothrond. But this brings us to something quite interesting. Because, remember, Gorthol of Dor Cuarthol was very much a known figure within Nargothrond. He was the leader of the Free People's Resistance in the Wild, right on their doorstep. And during the height of his might, many elves of Nargothrond wanted to join him and to fight alongside the mysterious Dread Helm in his war against Morgoth. But King Ordreth would not allow it. He prioritized the secret defense of Nargothrond 
over military prowess on the field of battle, and so he sent his messengers to Gorthol, telling him that in all he might do or devise in his war, he should not set foot in the land of Nargothrond. And yet, only a few months later, if that, here Gorthol is, now a permanent guest of King Ordreth's. But Ordreth has no idea that this Agarwine son of Umarth is Gorthol the Dread Helm, and he certainly has no idea that both of these people are also Turin, son of Hurin. When he arrives in Nargothrond as Gwyndor's guest, Turin is only 25 years old, going on 26, but over the next few years he is going to grow into one of the mightiest captains that Nargothrond has ever known. From the moment that Turin sets foot here, the fate of the kingdom and the fate of the hero are now inextricably tied together. So, the first significant thing that happens to Turin in Nargothrond is that his now blunt black sword, Anglakel, is forged anew for him by the cunning smiths of Nargothrond. And he renames this sword Gurthan, which means the Iron of Death. And I guess this would be the perfect opportunity for me to give that bit of backstory on this fascinating sword. A sword that began its life in space. Sort of. Anglakel is one of those fantastic Sindarin words where we can very easily see exactly what it means. Ang means iron. We see that all over the place. Angband, Angmar, Angrist, Angrod, Angayanor, even Gurthang literally means death iron. Luck, however, is a much less commonly seen Sindarin element, but we do see it in Dagor Bragolak, which means Battle of Sudden Flame. Luck means flame. And L is an incredibly common part of various Elvish languages. We see Elrond, Elbereth, Elendil, Elassar, even the word Eldar, which is the name that the Valar gave to the first elves, shares this root. And what L most commonly means is star. This is a sword that was forged from the iron of a fiery star. In other words, it was made from the metal of a meteorite. The only meteorite ever mentioned in the entire Legendarium, apart from a single line in a single poem from the adventures of Tom Bombadil. But as fascinating as this extraterrestrial metal is, the guy who found it and fashioned it into the sword Anglakel is even more fascinating, though definitely not in a positive way. Throughout the 100 plus videos on this channel, I have on occasion sometimes expressed my less than effulgent feelings towards Feanor. I think he's a terrible person, but I have always been very careful to never describe him as the worst elf. He has two particularly awful sons who could both throw their names into the hat for that title, but even outside of the House of Feanor, there is another elf who is so stupefyingly sinister, he makes Feanor look like a responsible babysitter by comparison. This guy is known as Aeol the Dark Elf. And although for the most part in Middle-earth, Dark Elf simply refers to an elf who has not beheld the light of Valinor, for example, Legolas, Thranduil, even Beleg Cuthalion himself is a Dark Elf, but that Dark label has nothing to do with their moral character. Except in the case of Aeol. This guy is dark in the most ominous sense of the word. 
Now, Aeol will be a much more important character when I get to the tale of the city of Gondolin, and I intend to make a whole series of videos about his origins and his actions and his family, but for now, what matters is that Aeol is an incredibly atypical elf. With an almost cartoonish capacity for cruelty and spite. But he does have at least one semi-redeeming feature, in that for a dark elf of the woodland, Aeol has an unusually close friendship with some of the dwarves in Beleriand. He came frequently as a guest to the dwarven mansions of Nogrod and Belagost, and from these dwarves of the Blue Mountains, Aeol learned much in the arts of crafting and forging. For all his many, 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 many sins, Aeol is at least very good at making things. Not unlike another dodgy elf I know of. Also, not unlike Sauron or Saruman. Crafting good things is not always a good thing in Tolkien's writings. Anyway, even among those other nefarious craftsmen, Aeol is still unique, in that he used a material that no one else in Middle-earth's history is ever known to have used. And that's because Aeol did not forge his arms and armour out of iron, or steel, or silver, or even mithril. Instead, he used a metal called Galvorn. And Galvorn is only found within the heart of a meteorite. It is described as black in colour and shining like jet. It is as hard as the steel of the dwarves, yet supple, thin, malleable, and incredibly lightweight. And yet it can turn aside any and all blades and darts. And so Galvorn is the perfect material with which to make armour for himself, which is exactly what Aeol did. And fun fact, this is true in real life, really, really recently, like a few months before this video was recorded, an American tech company developed a new material that they describe as stronger than steel, lighter than aluminium, or aluminium for you American viewers, and has the conductivity of copper. And, as is so often the case, the brilliant minds who developed this new material also happened to be Tolkien fans. So, of course, this super strong, super light, super conductive, real world material that's supposedly going to revolutionise the future is actually called Galvorn. It's very possible that in a few years' time, Galvorn might be a very commonly used word all around the world. Anyway, armour was obviously not the only thing Aeol forged out of this black meteoric metal. He also made a sword. Actually, he made two swords. One of them he called Anguirel, which means Iron of the Eternal Star, and that sword Aeol kept for himself. It will show up later in the tale of Gondolin. But the other sword, Anguirel's sister, that one he called Anglakel. And Anglakel he gave away. There are a few different accounts of Aeol's origins that were constructed over Tolkien's lifetime, but in all of them he lives apart from the other elves of Doriath in shady halls of his own, within the forest of Narn Elmoth. Now, Narn Elmoth is not within the girdle of Melian, so it's not technically part of Doriath, but it is the forest in which Thingol and Melian met. It is a very important part of their story, and it is still very much under the authority of the Grey King. Which is why Aeol begrudgingly gifted Anglakel to High King Eluthingol as payment for allowing him to dwell in Nan Elamoth and kind of be left alone to do his own dodgy thing there. Eluthingol readily accepted this exquisitely crafted black sword, but he never actually used it. Thingol already had a sword of his own. But if we now fast forward to the events of this story, we will come to the moment when young Turin first fled from Doriath after indirectly killing no one's favourite elf, that 
absolute douchebag, Cyros. And following that, wonderful Beleg Kuthalion asked his king's leave to go after Turin and to guard him and to guide him. During this conversation, Beleg asked Thingol for a sword that he could use in the wild, and Thingol told him to choose any blade in Menegroth's armories except his own. And of course, the blade that Beleg fatefully chose was Anglakel, the quote-unquote gift of Aeol. However, even as Thingol turned the hilt of this sword towards Beleg for him to take, Doriath's queen, Melian the Maya, looked at the blade, and she said, There is malice in this sword. The heart of the smith still dwells in it, and that heart was dark. It will not love the hand that it serves, neither will it abide with you for long. As is literally always the case, Melian is right. But Anglakel is incredibly hard, and incredibly sharp, and incredibly light, so Beleg took it anyway. We all know what happened after that, and through a series of very unfortunate events, Anglakel ultimately found its way into the hand of Turin at the absolute worst possible moment. He tragically, and very unknowingly, used it to slay his beloved Beleg Kuthalion, and so now the sword belongs to him. But just as Turin is renaming and reinventing and reforging himself in Nargothrond, so too does he rename this reforged sword. As I've already said, from now on this blade shall be known as Gurthang, the Iron of Death. And although there will come a moment later in the story when Turin tries to put Gurthang away and use it no more, he is not destined to succeed. Throughout the rest of his life, this sinister black sword Gurthang will be Turin's primary weapon, and he is going to use it to kill quite a few significant characters, sometimes in a very positive, awesome way, other times less so. Anyway, among the elves of Nargothrond, the Black Sword of Agarwine, son of Umarth, becomes an incredibly iconic blade, and as Turin becomes more and more known and liked throughout Nargothrond, the elves of that kingdom come to know him by another new name. They call him the Mormegil, which means the Black Sword. Although Gil is also a Sindarin word meaning star. We see it in Gilgalad, in Gilthoriel, Osgiliath, and in Thorongil which, in 6,000 years' time, will be the alias that is used by Aragorn to protect his secret identity. Yet one more interesting parallel between Turin and Aragorn. The elves of Nargothrond who know Turin well call him Agarwine, but before long, all people in Beleriand have heard stories of the Mormegil, the mortal man, who commands such a degree of epicness that even among elves, he is something else. In fact, it is because of his prowess and his skill in warfare with orcs that the Mormegil finds favour with King Ordreth. And eventually, the Mormegil is even made a member of the King's War Council, alongside the friend who brought him here, Prince Gwyndor. But it is at this point in the story that cracks begin to form in this friendship. Turin and Gwyndor have a huge amount of respect for each other, but when it comes to matters of war, they are on very different pages. 
as I've already explained, Nardgothron's entire military strategy, at least in the days of Ordreth, is based around ambush and stealth and secret arrow. The elves of Nardgothrond are sneaky fighters, Turin is absolutely not. And he says so. Within the war councils of King Ordredreth, Turin openly urges the elves of Nardgothrond to abandon their policy of secrecy, and they should instead use their strength to attack the servants of the enemy, to open battle and pursue. But, in this matter, Gwyndor spoke ever against Turin. It's not personal, there is absolutely no ill will between these friends, but Gwyndor's perspective on Morgoth and Turin's perspective are forged out of wildly different contexts. More so than anyone else in Nargothrond, Gwyndor really does know what he's talking about. He had been in Angband for 17 years, he had had a glimpse of the power of Morgoth and had some inkling of his designs. Gwyndor says to Turin and to everyone else at the council of King Ordreth, petty victories will prove profitless at the last. For thus Morgoth learns where the boldest of his enemies are to be found, and gathers strength great enough to destroy them. Only in secrecy lies hope of survival until the Valar come. Now, this may sound a little bit hopeless on Gwyndor's part, but a few paragraphs later, he explains to Turin that among the Noldor in Middle-earth, there is a prophecy for telling how all of this is going to end. Way back when the Noldor first left Valinor, Mandos, the doomsman of the Valar, declared, among many other things, Tears unnumbered ye shall shed, and the Valar will fence Valinor against you and shut you out. In other words, thanks to Feanor and his unfortunate history of mass murder, the Valar kind of washed their hands of the Noldorene rebels. They wouldn't hinder the elves from journeying to Middle-earth, but they also wouldn't help them once they got there. At least that was the official policy. I've already explained how Ulmo straight up ignored it when giving dreams to Finrod and his cousin Turgon, but for the most part, yeah. The Valar are not supposed to get involved. However, according to this prophecy that Gwyndor explains to Turin, one day a messenger from Middle-earth will come through the shadows to Valinor, and Manwe will hear, and Mandos will relent. If you know how the First Age ends, then you know exactly what Gwyndor is getting at here. If not, don't worry, I'll get to it in good time. But I think one of the major points in this debate between Gwyndor and Turin is to highlight once again this differing perspective between immortals and mortals, the firstborn and afterborn children of Iluvatar. Gwyndor wants to wait and protect and defend until the day comes when this prophecy might be fulfilled, but Turin is a mortal. He does not have time in abundance, and he says, Though mortal men have little life beside the span of the elves, they would rather spend it in battle than fly or submit, for victory is victory, however small. And when Gwyndor mentions the Valar and states that they are the free people's only hope, Turin replies with the Valar they have forsaken you, and they hold men in scorn. What use to look westward across the endless sea to a dying sunset? There is but one Valor with whom we have to do, and that 
is Morgoth. And if in the end we cannot overcome him, at least we can hurt him. Which, to be fair, is a pretty badass thing to say, but Gwyndor claps back at this with some tough love that I think Turin does really need to hear. Gwyndor says, A darkness is on you if you speak of the Valar as foes of elves and men. You think of yourself and of your own glory and bid us each do likewise, but we must think of others beside ourselves. For not all can fight and fall, and those we must keep from war and ruin for as long as we can. But still, Turin disagrees, and his mind turns to the women and the children in his homeland of Dor Lomin, people who also could not fight for themselves, but did not hold back the men from the near Nyeth Arnoidiad, to which Gwyndor replies with an armor-piercing point. But they suffered a greater woe than if that field had not been fought. This marks the end of Turin and Gwyndor's debate, and although in my mind Gwyndor is clearly in the right here, maybe I'm only saying that because I know what's going to happen, but either way, King Ordreth the kind of okay disagrees, and within a relatively short period of time, Turin advanced greatly in the favour of Ordreth, and he became the chief counsellor of the king, who submitted all things to Turin's advice. When Turin came to Nargothrond, he was but Gwyndor's guest. Now, he is effectively the king in all but name. Ordreth wears the crown, but it is Turin who truly rules the kingdom. And so, in that time, the elves of Nargothrond forsook their secrecy, and great store of weapons were made. But by far the most significant impact that Turin has upon this stealthy subterranean kingdom is that he counsels the building of a mighty stone bridge to connect the secret doors of Felagund with the lands on the eastern side of the river Narog. It is on this east side of the river, upon the guarded plain of Talath Dirnen, that the servants of the enemy gather. And so the logic behind Turin's bridge is that it should allow the warriors of Nargothrond to arrive upon their chosen battlefields far more swiftly and to make war far more readily. And although there may be a nagging voice in the back of your mind screaming, this is not a good idea, Turin, I do need to point out just how truly epic Turin has become. By his 26th year, Turin now reached full manhood, and he was in truth the son of Morwen Elethwen to look upon. Tall, dark-haired and pale-skinned, with grey eyes and his face more beautiful than any other among mortal men in the Elder Days. Now that he had his way, and all went well, he was courteous to all, and less grim than of old, so that well nigh all hearts were turned to him, and many called him Adanavel, the elf man. Agarwine, Adanavel, and the Mormegil, three new names for our newly remade hero. And what a hero he is. Frustrating, yes, but also spectacularly cool. So valiant was Turin, and so exceedingly skilled in arms, especially with sword and shield, that the elves said that he could not be slain, 
save by mischance or an evil arrow from afar. Therefore, they gave him dwarf mail to guard him, and in a grim mood he found in the armories a dwarf mask, all gilded, and he put it on before battle, and his enemies fled before his face. Now, Turin has uh, very, very famously already owned a dwarf forged mask, the super iconic dragon helm of Dorlomin, from which he acquired the name Gorthol. However, in every published version of this story, Turin's dragon helm is not mentioned again after the fall of Amon Ruth and the destruction of the Gaurwife. It would seem that Turin lost it when he was taken captive by the orcs. Which means that at absolutely no point in the story does Turin ever wield the black sword Gurthang or Anglakel whilst also wearing the dragon helm of Dor Lumin. Despite the fact that he is portrayed with both of these artifacts on the front cover of this book. However, I do not bring this up as a criticism of Alan Lee's fantastic artwork, there's more to this than meets the eye. You see, although it's never mentioned in The Children of Hurin or in The Silmarillion, there is a note in The Unfinished Tales in which Christopher Tolkien tells us about an isolated scrap of writing which tells that in Nargothrond, Turin would not wear the dragon helm lest it reveal him. But in an upcoming battle that I will talk all about in the next video, he totally did wear it, according to that isolated scrap of writing. So I guess we will never know Tolkien's final intent here, but he did at least entertain the idea that perhaps the dragon helm of Dor Lumin was not forever lost to Turin. Maybe he does have it with him in Nargothrond, but he just chooses not to wear it. Maybe he will wear it again, or maybe he won't. It's one of those things that we, the reader, get to decide. Anyway, it's at this point in the story that Turin, or Agarwain, or Adanavel, or the Mormegil is bestowed a fourth brand new name whilst in Nargothrond. But this one is, I think, the most interesting to analyse. However, before I can get to it, first we need to circle back around to that princess of Nargothrond, Orodreth's daughter, the golden lady Finduilas. As I've already mentioned, 17 years ago, Finduilas was betrothed to Gwyndor. But then came the Nirnaeth Arnoidiad, and everything went horribly wrong. Her betrothed disappeared for 17 years, and when he returned, he was but a shadow of his former shape. And he was accompanied by this man-elf, Adanavel, more beautiful than any other among mortal men in the Elder Days. But... It's not just Turin's looks that attract the attentions of Finduilas, she is absolutely fascinated by the race of men, of whom she had seen few and seldom. At first, Turin and Finduilas hang out, but only when Gwyndor is also present. However, as time moves on and their friendship grows, Turin and Finduilas begin to take real pleasure in each other's company. Finduilas is fascinated by this mysterious mortal, and Turin is reminded of the golden-haired women that he once knew back in Dor Lumin, the women of the House of Hador, and specifically, Finduilas reminds Turin of his golden-haired sister. Now, Turin actually has two golden-haired sisters, but one of them he's never met, and the other one has been dead for 21 years. Yet, in the company of Finduilas, Turin finally feels free to speak openly about his dear Lalith. 
He doesn't give away any details that might lead to his true identity being exposed, but he talks to this elvish princess about how wonderful his late sister was, and what she might now be like if she had survived past childhood. However, as Turin and Finduila spend more and more time together, Finduilas becomes less and less convinced that Agarwayan son of Umarth is this guy's real name. She perceives that there is a lot more to Turin than what he's revealing, and so she comes up with another name for him. She has absolutely no idea what he's actually called, and she knows that he's never going to tell her the truth, so she calls him The Secret. And what is so great about that is that the Sindarin word for secret, the new name that Finduilas gives to Turin, is Thurin. She is so close to being exactly spot on. I don't know if Tolkien was, like, consciously being a language genius here, or if it's just a coincidence born out of the fact that he was such a language genius in every other part of his life, but either way, I think it is worth lingering on. Finduilas knows next to nothing about the real Turin, not even his name, and yet her instincts are fantastically close to the mark. Anyway. Unfortunately, there is a bit of a sad side to this otherwise very wholesome friendship between Turin and Finduilas, and that is because Gwyndor is still very much in the picture. But among the elves of Nargothrond, he is not treated as well as I would like. At the same time, Turin advanced in the favour of King Ordreth, Gwyndor fell into dishonour for he was no longer forward in arms, and his strength was small, and the pain of his maimed left arm was often upon him." Which, right, I don't think reflects particularly positively upon the elves of Nargothrond. Gwyndor is the guy who once made Morgoth tremble, let us not forget, he is the one who rescued their beloved Adanavel and brought him to Nargothrond in the first place. Without Gwyndor, there wouldn't even be a Mormegil. And what, he's fallen into dishonour because his arm hurts? I, w yes, I imagine it does. On account of that time, he lost a hand while epically escaping from the dungeons of the Dark Lord. He's not forward in arms anymore. No one in Nargothrond was forward in arms until about ten minutes ago, except for Gwyndor. Come on, elves of Nargothrond, be better. Try having a little bit of empathy for the guy who, you know what, I'm just gonna come out and say it, is the best one among you. Whew. Now that I've got that off my chest, let's talk about the complicated relationship triangle that is Gwyndor, Turin, and Finduilas. And I'll begin with Turin, who, unlike most of the other people in Nargothrond, actually, I think, handles this really quite well. He perceives that Gwyndor's friendship grew cooler towards him, but instead of being offended by this, Turin is concerned for Gwyndor's well-being. He worries that his friend might slip back into the horror and woe that was instilled in him in Angband, and he's unsettled by the thought that Gwyndor may be grieved over their disagreements in the Council of King Ordreth. And this concern really upsets Turin, for he loved Gwyndor as his guide and healer, and was filled with pity for him. Once again, what we're seeing here is Turin's immense capacity for compassion and pity, traits that he has embodied since he was a child. However, for Finduilas, things have become even more complicated. 
Once upon a time, as I say, she was betrothed to Gwyndor, and she does still love him very much, but in truth, Finduilas was torn in mind. For she honoured Gwyndor and pitied him, and wished not to add one tear more to his suffering, but against her will, her love for Turin grew day by day, and she thought of Beren and Luthien. This is huge, or at least it could have been. Don't forget, on his mother's side, Turin's grandfather was Beren's cousin. They are kin. And Finduilas' grandmother, or great-grandmother in some versions, was Luthien's cousin. In the entirety of Middle-earth's history, there are three elf-man romances that changed the world. There is also Mithralas and Imazor in the Third Age, but they're more of a fun fact about the princes of Dol Amroth than they are a couple that changed the world. Also, they split up pretty immediately after having children. So, yeah, of the elf-man relationships that really matter, there are three. Beren and Luthien, Turin's cousin, Tuor and Idril, and of course, the direct descendants of both those couples, Aragorn and Arwen. But there was a moment, right here in Nargothrond, where those three could have become four. However, in the exact words of Tolkien, Turin was not like Beren. He was very glad to be in Finduilas's company, he enjoyed her very much as a friend, but he did not love her Turin is the only mortal in all of Middle-earth's history who is loved by an elf, but doesn't do anything about it. Perhaps Finduila simply reminds Turin too much of his sisters, and of course the very last thing that Turin would ever want would be to fall in love with his, um, sister. So, Turin turns the topic of conversation away from himself and back towards Gwyndor. He tells Finduilas, Gwyndor has suffered in the darkness of Angband, and it is hard for one so valiant. He needs all solace and a longer time for healing. When Finduilas agrees by saying she knows it well, Turin tells her, but we will win that time for him. Nargothrond shall stand. Never again will Morgoth the Craven come forth from Angband, and all his reliance must be on his servants. They are the fingers of his hands, and we will smite them and cut them off till he draws back his claws. Nargothrond shall stand. How great is that? Turin's obsession with turning Nargothrond into a mighty military power is not destined to end up being a good thing, but it is much harder to condemn when justified in these terms. It's not just personal glory that motivates the Mormegil. He truly does want what's best for his friends. As much as anything else, Turin is fighting for the people he loves. He always has been, but Shortly after Turin's conversation with Finduilas about Gwyndor, Gwyndor has a conversation with Finduilas about Turin. And I've got to say, Gwyndor's attitude towards the unrequited love that his betrothed feels towards his close friend is unbelievably mature. I feel like some other writers might take this opportunity to inject a whole load of, like, relationship drama into the story, but that's just not the kind of conflict that interested Tolkien. And it's not what motivates Gwyndor. Instead, he is far more concerned with Finduilas' well-being than he is with whether or not she loves him back. And the thing that concerns Gwyndor more than anything else 
is the curse that Morgoth has placed upon Hurin and all his kin. A curse that only he and Turin are even aware of in Nargothrond. And because no one in Nargothrond knows that the Mormegil, Thurin Adanavel Agarwine, son of Umarth, is actually Turin, Gwyndor has no one with whom to voice these concerns. But he is beginning to recognise that Turin's deeds and his counsels are indeed beginning to change Gwyndor's home and his kin, and he knows that the shadow of Turin's curse now lies upon them all. And his beloved Finduilas is unknowingly standing in the eye of that storm. And so Gwyndor goes to Finduilas and they have a pretty heavy conversation together about Turin. But again, petty relationship drama has absolutely nothing to do with it. Gwyndor begins this chat by commenting on the sadness that he's noticed within Finduilas and he says to her, Daughter of the house of Finarfin, let no grief lie between us, for though Morgoth has laid my life in ruin, you still I love. But go, whither love leads you." Gwyndor knows that Finduilas has feelings for Turin, and he doesn't in any way seem to really begrudge her those feelings. Her happiness matters more to Gwyndor than anything else. But he does have a warning for her. He says, Not fitting, is it, that the elder children of Iluvatar should wed the younger, in other words, elves wedding men. Nor is it wise, for they are brief and soon pass to leave us in widowhood while the world lasts. This man is not barren, even if he be as fair and as brave. A doom lies on him, a dark doom, and if you will, your love shall betray you to bitterness and death. For hearken to me, though he is indeed Agarwine, son of Umarth, his right name is Turin, son of Hurin, whom Morgoth holds in Angband and has cursed all his kin. Doubt not the power of Morgoth Bauglir, is it not written in me?" Now there is a little bit more to their conversation, I don't have time to go over the entire back and forth, but it leaves Finduilas in a bit of a difficult position. On the one hand, she is ashamed of herself for not loving Gwyndor more than she does, and she considers herself faithless for loving Turin against her own will and being unable to escape that love. Yet we also see quite a few instances where Finduilas is described as queenly, and she demonstrates a great deal of compassion towards both Gwyndor and Turin. After learning the truth, about her new friend's identity, Finduilas goes to Turin and she says to him, Thurin, Adanavel, why did you hide your name from me? Had I known who you were, I should not have honoured you less, but I should better have understood your grief. However, upon hearing these words from Finduilas, Turin feels a sting of betrayal from his friend Gwyndor. So he goes to Gwyndor and confronts him, saying, In love I hold you for rescue and safe keeping, but now you have done ill to me, friend, to betray my right name and call down my doom upon me from which I would lie hid. But to this Gwyndor replies with a line of dialogue that I think hits the nail of this entire video right on its head. Everything that I have talked about in regards to Agarwine and Adanavel and Mormegil and Thurin and Gorthol and Neathan the Wronged, all of it can be summed up with this one sentence. 
Gwyndor says, The doom lies in yourself, not in your name. Now, I do not want to imply that Turin and Gwyndor are not friends anymore, they absolutely are friends, but their friendship is now a little bit more complicated than it ever was before. On the one hand, they want the exact same thing, to protect their shared home and the people they love from the most diabolical enemy conceivable, but they have very different perspectives on how best to do that. And in the next video, we will see why this matters so very, very much. But it's not all doom and gloom. Things are destined to take a dark turn. But before they do, there is a flicker of triumph. Tolkien glosses over it in a single sentence, but I do want to linger for at least a moment on this point. Turin spends five years in Nargothrond, being an absolute legend. Five years of Nargothrond being a military power. Five years of the Mormegil. And by the end of those five years, Turin will be 31 years old. So this is our hero in his prime. And I really do want to emphasize that. Right at the beginning of the very last hundred years of the First Age, there is a short but significant stretch of five years where a mysterious masked hero known throughout all Beleriand as the Mormegil led a brand new army from Nargothrond to take back the guarded plain and to continue the war that Gorthol of Amon Ruth began alongside Beleg Cuthalion and the Gaurwaith. Five uninterrupted years of being a constant enemy of the true enemy. But honestly, I cannot in good conscience end this video on any note other than one of foreboding. Thanks to the legendary Mormegil, Nargothrond is no longer secret. Its greatest advantage has been lost. And now, the time has come for Morgoth to unleash his greatest weapon. Perhaps his most dangerous servant, who will very soon become known as the Dragon King of Nargothrond. Glaurung the Golden is coming. And I feel compelled to tell you that the next chapter in this story is another one of those that Tolkien gave a very spoilery name to. So, in the next video, I will talk all about what went down when the dragon came south. I'll talk all about the great battle that he brought to this part of the world, and I'll explain exactly why Tolkien named chapter 11 of this story The Fall of Nargothrond. So, to make sure you don't miss that, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to click like and leave a comment on this video if you want to. However, until next time, as always, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy. And Navire Melanine.